Welcome to the CFE Media and Technology Education Session, specifying generator set fuel sources. I'm your moderator, Amara Rosges, with CFE Media and Technology. In keeping with our CEP policy, please take some time to read the quality assurance slide. This session is designed for technicians and engineers who want to understand the fundamentals of how to specify and design generator set fuel sources. Here's a list of learning objectives. We'll touch on these in today's presentation. Additional resources can be viewed and downloaded on the left side of the screen below the session's agenda. Additional resources can be viewed and downloaded on the left side of the screen below this session's agenda. If you'd like to take notes within the session, click on the left panel labeled Notes to do so. The live session will begin at 2 p.m. Central, 3 p.m. Eastern, and the live Q&A starts at approximately 2.45 Central, 3.45 Eastern, or about 40 minutes later. Answers will be archived with this session. Those Q&A details are in the meetings tab on the left side of the screen, and the Zoom invitation is also under the Q&A session. That industry expert will be answering questions live, so don't forget to join us. Here's some information about obtaining PDHs for today's session. Before tuning in to our presentation, we'd like to share a brief video from today's sponsor. The world is facing an ever-growing demand for power. So we're looking beyond today's challenges. With the drive to invent power solutions for the new world you work in. With digital-driven engineering and thinking that have reinvented power generation to meet critical needs. With the vision to create entirely new power technologies for you, for the world, and for the future. And the imagination to rethink the concepts of sustainability and true energy independence. The people of Cummins have our eyes on your future and are the driving force behind the next generation of power. Today's speaker is Mark Taylor with Cummins. I'm your moderator, Amara Rosges with CFE Media and Technology. Mark Taylor is a technical advisor on the Cummins North America technical marketing team. He focuses on technical education and topics important to the power generation industry. Mark has also served in roles that provide application engineering support for all Cummins power generation products in the North American market. Mark has worked on this topic before and has presented on it before, so I'm looking forward to a great presentation. Please enjoy this tutorial, note any questions that you have along the way, and then join Mark and me for the question and answer session. You can see the Q&A details in the meetings tab on the left side of the screen. Okay, Mark, let's begin. All right. Thank you so much, Amara. First, before I get into the technical content, I want to share that I will be covering a fair bit of code language and requirements here today. We'll be leaning on NFPA 110, the EPA, New Source Performance Standards, uh, and the NEC. We at Cummins work with these organizations on a frequent basis, uh, so we feel we can offer a really good faith, uh, good faith insight and guidance, but not a formal interpretation. Um, that said, uh, we do not represent these organizations in any capacity, but we're more than happy to work with you in discussions with these organizations. So I am going to kick things off with a question to you all, uh, just to make sure that you are all awake and aware for this presentation here today. So I'll kick things off with an open-ended question. When compared to a diesel generator set, what are some of the differentiators that are unique to a natural gas or propane fueled generator set? 
Okay, so you can answer this question. On the left side of your screen, there are a variety of things that you can connect with, including this poll. All right, I'll give you a second and see uh, as those results start coming in. But the first and foremost, as always, fuel storage. I think that's one of the biggest things that always comes front of mind. Of course, it's, it's perhaps the, the most obvious one. Using the utility gas, yep, that's a really good one. Uh, Customer preference, yeah. <laughs> uh, initial cost, yeah, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about that in just a little bit. Um, but fuel storage, wow, that, yeah, that one's coming in uh, pretty prevalent here. Uh, we'll, we'll be talking about that for both for diesel and gas. Well, awesome. Uh, thank you so much for engaging with that, but I, I'm gonna go ahead and put a pin on it and, and, and move forward. Uh, thanks so much for, for, uh, for giving us those answers. Uh, so. Let's get started by providing a high level overview of the fuels themselves. As I said, we'll be looking at some similarities and differences as we proceed through this presentation. Diesel is known to be a power dense source of fuel. That power density is also quite constant. In the United States, it would be regulated by ASTM D975 as ultra low sulfur diesel. Uh, there are diesel substitutes in the market, such as biodiesel, whether it is a blend or 100% biodiesel. There are also paraffinitic, renewable diesel fuels on the market as well. But for the purposes of this presentation, when I mention diesel, I'll be primarily speaking in general terms, usually about petroleum-based diesel. On the other hand, Gaseous fuels may not be as energy dense and may encounter more variability in energy content. Generally speaking for the United States, the energy content of pipeline natural gas is quite reliable, relatively speaking, but it is not immune to fluctuations or regional differences. Just like how I mentioned, I'll be discussing diesel in general terms. When discussing gas as a fuel for generator sets, I'll be primarily referring to pipeline natural gas. At a very high level, this hierarchy shows the relative energy density of the fuels between liquid and gaseous fuels. For the space they take up, diesel fuel has the highest energy density among these fuels. Historically, it has been perhaps too easy to draw a correlation between energy density and generator set performance, such as starting times, and transient performance when taking on heavy loads. But the advances in technology, we have, uh, have been trending in such a way to really blur the lines between those notions. Uh, I'll get back to that point as we go through the performance requirements section of this presentation. This next slide takes a little bit of a deeper look at the variety of gaseous fuels, and you might even recognize many of them. Again, looking at energy content measured in BTUs, we start on the high end of this list with pipeline natural gas. Compared to other forms of fuel in the gaseous form, this will also very likely be the fuel used in standby applications. As you go down the list, many of these fuels may be a result of an industrial process or treatment. These fuels are at times consumed on site with a generator set designed for efficient continuous duty cycles with these fuels to export electricity. That or these fuels may be cleaned and refined and sold as a commodity. Compared to its peers, pipeline natural gas is generally high energy and freer of contaminants. That said, natural gas cannot be assumed to be of a perfect standard composition. Gas constituents will vary by geographical area. Its composition can also vary if it depends on a single well that may be aging, for example, uh, as opposed to a well-diversified local pipe network that draws from multiple sources. Though pipeline natural gas is generally quite reliable in the United States, it never hurts to conduct a fuel analysis to be sure of the energy content if there is ever any doubt. Generator set suppliers will be glad to assist in interpreting the results uh, of that fuel analysis with you. Recall, 
A reciprocating internal combustion engine is converting chemical energy of a fuel into mechanical energy by capturing the force of combustion in the cylinder of the engine. Ideally, the spark plug is providing that initial flame that drives that combustion. That brings us to one of the most important means of describing a gaseous fuel, which is done by methane index number. This value describes how likely a fuel is to combust uncontrollably, creating knock or pinging in an engine. On a scale of 1 to 100, a methane index number that is higher may be less likely to lead to engine knock, where a lower value may be more likely to provide issues with engine performance. Correlating this into practical terms, a lower methane index number may mean a gaseous fuel generator set may. This table on the right outlines a generic example from one of our products. Let's say, for example, if the methane index number cannot exceed a value of 57 per the fuel analysis, we'll be looking at a max available power of this generator of 75% of its nameplate rating in order to ensure best performance. Generally speaking, a fuel analysis of pipeline natural gas will produce a nice and high methane index number, around 80 to 90. And in the graphic on the right, this seeks to show how the methane index number of pipeline natural gas compares to some other common fuels. So let's connect the dots between uh, my first specification recommendation that I provided uh, earlier about seeking out the fuel's methane index number with a fuel analysis whenever there's any doubt as to the quality, and knowing the properties and methane index number of a fuel, one should be able to draw a straight line from that value to a generator set manufacturer's data sheet to confirm that the product will meet performance requirements. This confirmation should be an expectation on a generator set manufacturer's data sheet. Uh, I'll just have this one up here for an example. Uh, it should be a common expectation and usually identified in the fuel section uh, of, a, of any uh, manufacturer data sheet. The next subject I'm going to cover are two terms that you may or may not be familiar with, and that's rich burn and lean burn. Generator set manufacturers may commonly refer to their products with these terms, and at the end of the day, I want you to recognize the meaning behind them, but also I want you to be assured that both may be suitable for your application. The key characteristics that are usually cited when explaining the differences between rich burn or lean burn are the air fuel ratio, the typical oxygen content in the exhaust air, and the typical applications where they are found, and lastly, the general expectations for emissions performance. Rich burn engines are generally, emphasis on generally, associated with fast starts and being able to handle larger block loads, very close in performance actually to diesel counterparts. They may also be known for needing some form of after treatment due to their emissions. Uh, we'll discuss emissions in more detail later in the presentation. Lean burn engine driven generator sets in turn are generally associated with high efficiency continuous duty applications. They also can often meet emissions requirements without the use of any after treatment, not always. The terms rich burn and lean burn generally are pointing to the air fuel ratios and amount of excess oxygen in the exhaust. These traits and characteristics are good to know for me as an engineer working for a manufacturer that happens to make these products. But for you as a specifying engineer or a design engineer, what should really matter at the end of the day is the performance of these engines. Investments in engine technology continue to advance, and as such, the lines between these two columns in reality are much more blurred now more than ever. There are lean burn generator sets that provide rapid response times and load acceptance that makes them a valid standby option. Also, there are peak shaving and continuous applications out there where a rich burn generator set is best suited for the job. So with that said, 
I like to challenge everyone when specifying a gaseous fuel generator set, keep a, per, keep a performance based mindset and avoid outright specifying terms such as rich burn and lean burn. Stick to the project requirements such as transit performance, emissions limits, start time. Avoid citing uh, the fueling or engine technology this way that you'll keep the broadest range of possibilities available uh, to fit your needs. I'm going to kick off this next section with a myth that gaseous generator sets may not be suitable for emergency or life safety applications. By the time I'm through with this section, we'll review this myth to see if it holds water. Let's begin by looking at how codes and standards regard generator sets powered by both fuel types. One of the leading concerns for gaseous fuel generator sets centers around the applicability of such a fuel for emergency standby systems. In the eyes of the NFPA 110, and this is a snippet from the 2019 version, by the way, uh, the emergency power supply, that's the generator set itself, can be permitted to be fueled by liquid fuel, liquefied petroleum gas, which is usually propane, and, uh, or of course, natural or synthetic gas. So to be clear, a gaseous fueled generator set is okay in the eyes of the NFPA 110. NFPA 110 also contains requirements pertaining, pertaining to the on-site storage of said uh, fuel sources. And I'll be spending the next handful of slides on this point. The first thing I'll mention is that NFPA 110 does indicate that where appropriate, level one emergency power supply systems may be fueled primarily from a natural gas utility source. This is to acknowledge that for many parts of the United States, the natural gas infrastructure is very reliable to the point where the gas line can be the sole source of fuel. However, this exception text below cites that in locations where the probability of interruption of that off-site fuel source is high, on-site storage of an energy source sufficient to allow full output of the EPSS, the emergency power supply system, to be delivered to the specified class in hours shall be provided. So the key operative word here is high. Um, and luckily for us, it's vague too. A high probability of gas utility interruption will drive the need for on-site source of fuel. In some regions of the country, let's take on California as an example, on-site storage is effectively a blanket requirement due to it being a seismically active part of the country. For many parts of the country, this discussion can be up to the local authority having jurisdiction and the local utility. To put this conversation that may occur between you and the local AHJ and the local utility into context, the Natural Gas Council put out a study that worked to quantify how reliable the nation's natural gas utility really is. Due to the natural gas infrastructure having such geographically dispersed production sources and the interconnected nature of the network, the natural gas network's reliability was quantified to be exceptionally high, robust enough to be considered a primary source of fuel for level one applications. So let's take a look at this map of the US that highlights this point a little bit more visually. Again, the driver of such a reliable source of fuel is that the infrastructure network and production sites are geographically dispersed and well interconnected. So I realize that I just covered a lot of nuanced code language in a relatively short span of time. I have this table here in an attempt to best summarize those on-site fuel storage requirements, whether it is diesel or gaseous fuel. Looking at the rows covering the different articles of the NEC and the columns for the different fuel types with diesel, which is inherently an on-site source of fuel, and then gaseous fuels, whether it is utility only, or if it also has an additional source of on-site fuel available as well. Of course, for a gaseous generator set, a power supply system will meet those on-site fuel requirements, uh, whether it is compressed natural gas or propane, for example, uh, if, if that's there and installed and provided. 
And to best summarize gaseous fueled generator sets with utility only sources of fuel, NFPA 110 level one systems must include on-site fuel storage if the likelihood of loss of that utility is high. Therefore, I recommend that this drives that conversation with you and the local HJ, the local utility on what their definition of high is. I also must note, I'm making a general assumption here that Article 700 loads generally fall in line with NFPA 110 level one requirements. Again, rely on the AHJ for confirmation if there's ever any doubt. Finally, I'll note here that Article 708, critical operations power systems, um, it does contain language that explicitly makes a call and it does require on-site fuel storage for inter internal combustion engine driven generator sets. There, there is no exception clause there for Article 708 loads. So in some scenarios, relying solely on the utility may be a more nuanced conversation with the AHJ, but those are conversations that happen frequently and relying on the utility as the sole source of fuel can be a very reliable means of fueling the generator set. Granted, I know that most of you have seen news stories or have personally experienced challenges that can shake our confidence in our fuel infrastructure. Our country as of late has dealt with some pretty massive challenges on what seems like an ever increasing rate. We've gotten ourselves out of a gasoline pipeline mess earlier this year uh, throughout the Gulf and East Coast following that ransomware attack. Just a few months prior to that, we experienced some pretty dire challenges in and around Texas with that terrible cold snap. And the names Ida and Katrina are also forever etched in the memory of those who are on uh, the Gulf Coast. Sandy for, for the East Coast, natural gas resiliency can be compounded by older and less, rely, less resilient infrastructure, uh, especially when they're hit hard with just uh, uh, massive uh, natural disasters. That said, for the times that we can point at natural gas networks letting us down during extreme circumstances, there are also other examples where the gas utility was holding strong while the diesel fuel infrastructure was challenged. How will a fuel truck deliver diesel with countless downed trees blocking the roads? Uh, how many other facilities will take priority over your building when fuel is scarce? Evaluating the particular circumstances, design, and yes, risk factors is what engineering is all about. That's why exercising and documenting best engineering judgment on a case-by-case -case basis is so important. Each location and each situation are so different, we can't make a claim that one source of fuel will always be better than the other. The next standard that we're going to cover here is ISO 8528. I'm certain it is being called out in your generator set specifications, but usually specs do not go much further than calling out the emergency standby power rating. I want to ensure that we level set expectations of calling out an ISO rating. The first thing to reinforce is that these ratings do not include any fuel type requirements. So it's effectively blind to the selection of fuel used in the generator set, whether it's diesel or gaseous. Now what ISO 8528 does cover in its definition of the standby rating is the expected duty cycle. Standby generator sets are typically used to back up a primary source of power. So the expectation is that the number of hours of runtime is generally low and that the loads are variable. Guidance on load factor over time is also called out. ISO 8528 is a reference standard and every reputable manufacturer of generator sets should be designing their products to at least meet these standards. So to continue, uh, by all means, continue to call ISO 8528 uh, in your specifications, but know that the selection of fuel source is not impacted by this standard. We discussed NFPA 110 earlier in this presentation, but you all know we can't go long without mentioning a different section of this crucial code. Uh, this time I'll be discussing the NFPA 110 type uh, of an emergency power supply system or EPSS. 
type is the maximum time in seconds that the EPSS will permit the load terminals of the transfer switch to be without acceptable electrical power. And just to reinforce this point, as there is another common misperception on this, this requirement is not just the generator set start time and not all the way to the individual components of a building, but this requirement is for the load side of the transfer switch for the emergency power supply system. That's the start and the, the finish line. Types can come in a variety of designations, but for life safety applications, you will most likely see requirements for type 10 for 10 seconds. And you may also have encountered requirements such as 60 to 120 seconds for other types of loads. What you will not see here, however, is NFPA 110 calling out a fuel type for the energy for the emergency power source uh, in order to fit the requirements of one type or the other. Just like the ISO 8528 example, these are performance based requirements, but they allow for generator sets based on any fuel type as long as they meet the requirements. Of course, Specify the NFPA 110 type to fit the needs of your application and applicable codes and uh, requirements. Do not let the start time requirement rule out a certain fuel type if both diesel and gaseous fuel generator sets can meet those requirements. Work with your generator set manufacturer for any help in understanding what options you have available to meet your needs. So with that, I hope what you take away is the notion of gaseous fueled generator sets not being acceptable for standby applications is indeed a myth. Don't rule them out with a broad stroke. ISO 8528 and NFP 110 certainly do not. Base that decision on the individual performance of the product based on your performance based specifications. Uh, we discussed that sometimes the AHJ and code requirements for on-site fuel storage may drive a more nuanced conversation on solely relying on natural gas utility as a primary source of fuel. Let a good understanding of the codes and a proper hazard analysis guide you in those decisions. Have that conversation early with local AHJs and bring in the help of your favorite generator set manufacturer whenever you need it. As you know, NFPA 110 plays a massive role in emergency power performance and reliability requirements. We touch on this standard so much in this industry, I provided links to some of our most recent resources on this crucial code that you can reference on your own time. Moving on to our next myth that I would like to bust for you is the notion that gaseous generator sets are always cleaner than their diesel counterparts and that they never need exhaust after treatment. Granted, some myths and misconceptions may have some basis in fact, but this conversation is more nuanced than this blanket assumption. So let's dive into those details. As this presentation's goal is to provide a comparison and a contrast on fuel sources, I'll now go into some of the details on which emissions constituents the EPA new source performance standards regulate within the context of diesel and gaseous fueled engines. First is NOx or oxides of nitrogen, and it is regulated for both diesel and gaseous engines. If I were to ask anyone to name one emissions constituent from memory, NOx is usually the one that I hear most often, and this is because uh, NOx requirements uh, have been really popular at the local level, and I will get into local requirements in just a bit. Next is hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons come in many different types of molecular structure and are both regulated in the diesel and gaseous engine space. Next is particulate matter, and it can best be described as anything that creates visible soot or smog, or perhaps more appropriately put, something that can be captured on a filter if it were held up to the exhaust. This is something that at a federal level is only regulated for diesel engines. Next is carbon monoxide, and again, this is regulated for both types of engines at the federal level. And lastly, oxides of sulfur are only regulated on compression ignition side. Now that we've covered the emissions constituents themselves, 
The other key part of the conversation is emissions requirements. First, we'll go into how gaseous and diesel fueled engines are identified and regulated at the federal level. In the United States, the federal level of requirements, uh, and I mentioned it before, EPA's new source performance standards. Reciprocating internal combustion engines are then identified into two main categories, compression ignition and spark ignited. Diesel engines fall under compression ignition as the heat of compression within the engine cylinder creates that combustion event. Gaseous engines fall under spark ignited category because as the name self describes, it takes a spark plug to create that combustion event. The next round of categories that are important to understand within the context of the US EPA is how that engine is being used. Let's compare stationary and non-road first. Once again, self-explanatory somewhat, a stationary application is one that is permanently installed. Non-road indicates that an engine is mobile, but it is not in the context of being the primary source of propulsion for the vehicle. It just happens to be mobile. A trailered generator set is a great example of one of our products that would be regulated in this space. Between the two types of stationary applications, there are those that are intended for emergency use and non-emergency use. Put plainly, an emergency application is one where the engine-driven generator set is used as a backup to a primary source of reliable utility power. In turn, non-emergency comes into scope for applications where the engine is running to produce power when there was otherwise an acceptable source of utility power present. Now that I've covered the basic categories and the terminology, let's dive into some of the nuances of emissions requirements and factory certification. For diesel fueled engines, as well as rich burn propane engines, it is incumbent on the engine manufacturer to factory certify their products. That's going through the required testing and reporting with the EPA for families of engines that are used in generator sets. For other engines, such as natural gas engines and lean burn propane engines, factory certification is optional. So what does this mean for you? For starters, it's not necessarily a bad thing at all, but what it may mean uh, is that it's important to know the engine certification status as it may drive that the end user or operator may be responsible for demonstrating compliance by following this tiered guidance that I have shown on the screen. Referring to this chart, the requirements for an owner or operator can be as basic as simply maintaining appropriate records on the engine's maintenance for relatively small products. For slightly larger products, the scope increases somewhat to initial performance testing within a year of engine startup. And for engines greater than 500 horsepower, the scope of work expands to include subsequent performance testing every 8,760 hours of runtime or three years, whichever comes first. So in keeping with a common theme here, lean on the generator set manufacturer to provide appropriate documentation demonstrating compliance with specific emissions levels or engine certification have them be clear if the product is factory certified or not. Bringing this slide back to your attention, where we sought to identify the types and usage categories for the federal level of the EPA new source performance standards, the federal level establishes a baseline level of requirements, but any local air board can exceed those requirements. It is tough to fit local air requirements into nicely named categories like the EPA's regulations, but simply just be aware that the local air board has the authority to regulate each emissions constituent above and beyond the EPA's limits. They can pick one or multiples of those different emissions constituents that we uh, discussed earlier. Furthermore, just because a certain emissions constituent is not regulated at all in the EPA space, that doesn't mean a local requirement will not exist for it. 
Uh, for example, there are areas of the country where for a spark ignited engine, particulate matter may still be regulated where it is not at the federal level. So as I've, as I mentioned before, the generator set manufacturer should be your partner in this process when it comes to precisely understanding their products. Require the manufacturers to demonstrate appropriate documentation, uh, demonstrating compliance within application limits of the US EPA new source performance standards for stationary or non-stationary engines as appropriate. This is also the case with specific emissions levels uh, at the local level as well. So far, I've covered the major emissions constituents that are present in different exhaust streams from diesel or gaseous fuel generator sets and the federal and local requirements around them. At times, it may be necessary for a generator set to include one or more after treatment technologies to meet these requirements. Particulate filters may seek to do, just as their name describes, uh, filter out particulates. Selective catalytic reduction can be an excellent means of removing NOx, but may introduce the complexities of supplying exhaust fluids such as urea. Oxidation catalysts and three-way catalysts are also common options at reducing carbon monoxide, hydrocarbons, or sometimes even uh, some particulate matter. That all said, avoid specifying specific emissions technology as that may over constrain an otherwise well constructed generator set specification. The selection of technology is a key output response from the vendor to a specification that indicates the usage and the duty cycle, as well as emissions requirements from federal and local codes. As always, reach out to the manufacturer earlier if there are any questions on these issues. So I hope I've effectively debunked this myth that started this whole conversation. Emissions requirements can vary by usage and by local jurisdictions. There are even regions of the country that may effectively push in an emergency use generator to use technology that in any other region of the country would be okay for running continuously all day, every day. So applying a blanket statement on one product or technology over the other, especially when the local requirements can be so variable isn't in everyone's best interests. So if you're interested in diving deeper into emissions requirements and emissions constituents, I have referenced here some excellent resources that you can use later. So this brings us to a concept check. Let's, let's take a quick break here and check in with you all. So when specifying a generator set solution for an emergency power system, Make sure to include and choose all that apply here. Is it US EPA and other applicable emissions requirements? The ISO 8528 power rating? NFPA 110 type requirements for the system? Engine air fuel ratio. Okay, so here's your opportunity to take this quick quiz, this concept check. I invite you to answer your question once again using your console. All right, I'm already starting to see the uh, the results start coming in here, and I am seeing a lot of activity on. Yep, A, B, and C are basically climbing, and uh, luckily for us, D is not getting so much attention. I think you all have done a really good job of of tracking along here. I'm I'm just seeing the results kind of keep on climbing, and yeah, that, that's awesome. Well. Thank you so much for engaging with that quick concept check. Um, I see that you all are really tracking along with us. And so, yeah, what, what was the final answer? A, B, and C. So engine air fuel uh, ratio, that was just kind of like my, my, my one thing I could try to slip in there. Again, we're, we're trying to look for performance-based requirements that the end user customer cares about, of course. Uh, and that's something, that, that's something that the manufacturer worries about on our side. Well, thank you so much for engaging with that concept check. Let's go into the final stretch of this presentation. In the last series of slides I have for you today, I'd like to go over the key installation considerations for gaseous and diesel generator sets. First, I would like to acknowledge the numerous items that are actually the same, or at least very similar between the two different kinds of generator sets. Both are powered by a reciprocating 
internal combustion engine and such produce vibrations that may need to be accommodated with proper mounting, uh, such as proper foundation design or anti-vibration mounts when necessary. Exhaust system routing designs for both generator sets are usually no different, uh, with key concerns being proper routing, muffler sizing, and termination points. Cooling system design uh, and sizing, as well as providing for airflow around the generator set are important. Uh, speaking of space considerations, the requirements for service access are generally the same between the two kinds of generator sets. The starting systems, especially the batteries, um, they're a crucial part in ensuring the reliability um, when the need to start uh, arises. Local noise ordinances and requirements are certainly blind to the type of fuel being used uh, for the generator set. Remote monitoring systems and the work that goes into the design of enclosures are all basically the same between diesel and natural gas generator sets. With all of that said, there are a lot of similarities for the application and the design considerations of gaseous and diesel fueled generators. We don't have enough time to cover all of these items in further detail. We would need hours more for these topics. If you are interested in learning any more about these design considerations, I absolutely endorse our in-depth application manual. Uh, it provides a wealth of generator set installation knowledge and it is brand agnostic. It covers these topics and so many more. Like I mentioned, that list of application similarities between diesel and gaseous generator sets is quite long. So we'll be covering the key differences between the two. First and most obvious is that diesel drives the need to store and maintain fuel on site. As we mentioned earlier, code requirements will drive the NFPA 110 class, which in turn drives the size of the on-site storage. The more fuel that is present, the more fuel that needs to be maintained. Fuel doesn't stay perfect forever. Above ground fuel tanks are open to the atmosphere and they need to breathe. A breathable tank not only allows for filling and fuel consumption, but also for accommodating seasonal and daily temperature fluctuations. Due to the inherent design characteristics of tanks being exposed to open air, it is unavoidable for tanks of this design to avoid the eventual introduction of water from humid air condensing on internal surfaces of the tank. Water in fuel is bad enough, but it can also lead to microbial growth, which can easily clog up a fuel filter and possibly lead to a shutdown of the engine. Regular testing allows a user to stay ahead of this issue. So the key takeaway here is to not take for granted that on-site stores of diesel fuel will stay perfect forever. NFPA 110 calls for annual testing of the fuel, and if the fuel is of substandard quality, it needs to be polished or potentially replaced. Another key tip, don't put off getting that service started. Establishing an early baseline result during commissioning is the best point of comparison for tests uh, and comparing results in the future. Compared to on-site storage requirements of diesel, gaseous fuel generator sets can potentially be much easier. As we mentioned earlier, if an installation can rely solely on the gas utility as the sole source of supply, then it doesn't have to be concerned at all uh, with these storage requirements. If on-site storage of gaseous fuel is needed, for example, propane, that fuel does not go bad. It is sealed from the environment. Its shelf life is basically limited uh, to the life of the tank. That all said, this is not to say that gaseous fuel generator sets are not without nuance. Generally speaking, a diesel generator set is usually fine so long as the fuel tank is quite close in proximity and full of fuel, of course. For a gaseous generator set, the key watch out is ensuring the gas supply can provide an adequate pressure and volume of fuel. Appropriate sizing of fuel lines needs to be done, factoring in all sorts of restrictions to flow 
such as long runs of pipe and elbows. Ensure that the gaseous generator set is fueled by a dedicated gas line. That serves two roles. First, to isolate the generator set from potential pressure and flow fluctuations from other parts of the facility, but also in the event of an emergency. Imagine a situation where firefighters or need, uh, need to isolate uh, sources of fuel to other components in a building, but they, of course they want to keep the emergency uh, generator set running. Again, it is important that these supply can provide enough volume and pressure of the fuel at the rated load of the generator set. That last part is an important distinction. A seemingly okay pressure reading when fuel is not in flowing does not mean it will be appropriate at full fuel consumption. To mitigate these challenges, at times installations may need uh, to include accumulators or compressors to, or supply boosters. Of course, the minimum requirements for pressure and flow should be readily available from the manu manufacturer data sheets for the generator set. Be sure to drive that confirmation from generator set vendors that their product descriptions provide this information. One other key differentiator I'll cover are the operating costs of generator sets fueled by diesel or natural gas. Generally speaking, kilowatt to kilowatt, when it comes to initial capital expenses to purchase and install a generator set, diesel tends to be the cheaper option. A lot of that driven by the power density of diesel engines. This is more, pro more pronounced on the larger generator products. Price is much closer to parity uh, especially at 200 kilowatts or under. Over the long term, however, due to the increased costs of procuring and maintaining diesel fuel, that edge does erode. That is one reason why when it comes to the non-emergency space, such as demand response or peaking, that gaseous fuel generator sets are quite popular compared to diesel. So if you are working with a customer that is open-minded about the possibility of both diesel and gaseous fuel generator sets for their next project, present the value argument in terms of initial versus long-term costs, as well as the convenience that gas fuel can offer. So I'd like to wrap up with one last myth that I would like to bust. And that is the notion that gaseous generator sets are always worse than diesel fuel generator sets when it comes to transient load response. Engine and fueling technology have definitely been blurring the lines between engine performance of both fuel types to the point where there is parity between them for a wide kilowatt range of products. Further, this is a great opportunity to highlight that performance against 100% rated load acceptance may be an interesting basis of comparison on paper but too often we see it as a key specification item, and that kind of load step is not nearly as practical as specifying and requesting a comparison between products based on the actual needed load and the performance of the application. The best way to evaluate how a generator set may perform against the loads and load sequencing in your design is to run it against the product's sizing software. I also challenge you to evaluate both diesel and gaseous fueled options, not ruling one out right from the onset. If you have any notions that diesel is always better than gaseous fueled generators, I'm sure you'll be surprised to see the results for yourself. Regardless of fuel choice, running the facility loads against a sizing software is the most robust approach to finding the best fit generator set for your application. So with that, I will sum up by saying that between diesel and gaseous fuel generator sets, there is a lot of parity between the two engine technologies. Natural gas can be a very reliable fuel source, even when sourced from the utility only. Emissions wise, there are some key differences, but generally the approach to meeting local and federal requirements are rather similar. In demand response or continuous operation, gaseous generator sets are an excellent choice to consider 
not only because of emissions, but also for its efficiency and for its fuel costs long term. In the standby space, I hope you come away empowered knowing that many of these products can meet the strict transient performance and start time requirements that are not only just done by diesel generator sets. At the end of the day, if you have a customer that is open to generator sets of either fuel type, I hope you feel empowered to have a constructive conversation on the merits of both. Further, I hope you also know that there is a network of resources and helpful individuals available to support you in these conversations. So with that, I will turn it back to you, Mara. Awesome. Thank you, Mark. That was a lot of great information. And now it's time for the question and answer portion. Please submit your questions using the Zoom question and answer interface. Today's speaker is Mark Taylor with Cummins Power Generation. I'm your moderator, Amara Rosgis with CFE Media and Technology.